These are some of the highlights in 7.1. Um, we have a, a lot of stuff around data management, um, which we'll see today. Um, a lot of it is around also um, streamlining the whole process of SIP processing. Um, this is a result of uh, work with the working groups um, and uh, also the project that we did with KB and others, um, a lot of feedback that we received around um, the SIP processing. Um, and this is an area where we're continuously trying to um, automate the process there um, and, uh, and make life easier for the technical analysts. Um, so we'll start by seeing uh, how we facilitated the error handling for batch SIPs um, and uh, several other areas uh, where we are, um, um, which, are, which are improving the indexing area, allowing exclusion of source metadata from indexing, which we'll talk about, um, and, uh, and several other improvements around data management. Um, we'll talk about preservation. Um, we're here. Uh, we also, this is a discussion that we had with the working groups around adding SIP processing events as provenance. Um, and uh, um, not just the events which occur after the IE is, uh, the AIP is created in the permanent repository. Um, we will then um, see uh, the editing of uh, linking IE identify, which is just, uh, another semantic unit, which is now editable. Um, and can not only be deposited into the system, uh, which allows uh, further flexibility around the linking mechanism in the uh, uh, between the entities. Uh, user experience, we have a nice, the, the dashboard is now personalized. It allows you to um, add in your own uh, uh, dashboards uh, currently from a subset of the, of the uh, uh, reports, but we'd also see uh, how this can be enhanced in the future. Um, and then REST APIs, we continue our, our work on uh, exciting work with the REST APIs, which we'll see uh, where we're standing there. Um, so, first of all, um, we I'll talk about the safe SIP processing events as provenance. So here, the 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 motivation here was that um, customers came along and said that um, events and processes that these SIPs uh, uh, go through throughout the SIP processing are events which are um, equally important as any other event which occurs on the actual um, uh, data once it's in the permanent, and therefore it also should be recorded as provenance. Um, and uh, uh, and therefore we we cherry picked several um, processes or decision uh, decisions which are made throughout the SIP processing, which are then recorded as uh, um, uh, provenance events, which can be. Um, so these are the three main uh, events which are being recorded. The first is moving to the next stage from the TA work wedge, which again, you know, in three four years time, you might want to see who who it was. And when uh, who made the decision um, if uh, to uh, um, to approve a uh, um, an erroneous uh, um, intellectual entity, for example, um, and then moving over from the three A workbench from the approval um, uh, workbench, and uh, finally, uh, when once the IE completes, moving to permanence. We don't actually have a provenance event today for when the uh, AIP was uh, was created. This is more of a system event. Um, not so much a um, not so much a uh, a user event. Um, so it really is once the IE is committed into the permanent repository, then we generate an, an event uh, which really could provides information mainly on the time the timestamp um, of when the AIP is, was created. Um, so we'll just see what this looks like in the system. Um, I mainly want you to see the. Um, the configuration here. Um, so, under the mapping table, as you know, we have the event management, which has all the events, and we have the event provenance, uh, which has only those which are provenance events. Um, so, we now expanded the event provenance and so there's several improvements here, regardless also of this uh, specific feature. Sorry, not in the right environment. Well, actually, it's quite good. Now you can see what it previously was. So first of all, there was no description. Uh, we didn't inherit the description from the events table. Um, not only that, but also the provenance indicator didn't actually have any impact. Um, so all of these had to be provenance events. Um, and uh, uh, there was no way of actually removing it. For some reason, one of these events, you do not wish to have them as provenance events. So all that has changed. And now we will open 
um, the parallel page in 7.1 in the mapping tables, sorry, go tables. Then uh, once we go into the event provenance, edit this table, we now have, first of all, we have a, the, all the descriptions now, so you don't have to go back and forth to cross-check what the uh, each event is. And now you can also remove um, a provenance indicator. You can change this to N, and that will impact the uh, uh, whether it is um, a provenance or not. I'm not doing that, but we've added now um, 48, 49, 333, all of these are the events which we just talked about. So we have also technical analyst moves to the next step. Assessor, arranger, approver, each of these have a new event, um, approving SIPs, right? All of these um, now have a provenance event. So in 10 years' time, you can uh, play the blame game on uh, all those who approved the, uh, uh, the content. Um, and uh, also we have a new event, 333, which is the, which, as I said, is a system-generated event. Um, out of the box, all of these are going to be in. They're going to be a no. Um, so if you want to turn them on, obviously not to change the existing behavior for, for all of the existing customers, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to have these uh, events uh, enabled, then uh, you just switch it on to a yes. Um, so I won't uh, show you an example now, but if we have time at the end, I'll show you also what it looks like. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. It looks like um, other events which you're used to using, uh, uh, which you're used to uh, seeing on the uh, uh, Mets, um, uh, where you have, of course, the um, agent um, in uh, these cases and the assessor, range approver, and technical analyst um, timestamp and uh, of the event ID. Um, so the edit uh, linking IA identifier. So this is uh, we've uh, um, um, added transparency. And the, the, it's now editable. Um, the IA identifier. This also came from customers who wanted to have further flexibility around creating the links between the different uh, premised entities. Um, so it was up to now. You could ingest it, but you couldn't actually edit it. So now in the um, metadata editor, as you can see here in the screenshot. Um, you can go in and uh, add a, a new linking ID identifier, edit it, and you have a drop down here for, of uh, we have a, a reserved set of, uh, um, of types um, according to premise. Um, and here you can also populate the value. Um, you can also, uh, um, uh, similar to other DNX values, you can also change this in batch um, by using the uh, uh, DNX tasks. Um, and this is true for all levels, I representation and file. So this has nothing to do with the structural IEs. Um, this is simply another uh, form of linking different entities in the system. So it doesn't also have any impact on the uh, uh, delivery. So infrastructure, um, as usual, you know, we are keeping all of our third party our third party upgrades uh, to the latest. Uh, so we have solar um, upgraded to 7.3. And we have the solar cloud uh, zookeeper um, upgraded to 357, which is the latest. Um, and this we've seen uh, quite significant uh, improvements in the indexing following this upgrade. Um, we've uh, run a Red Hat 8 certification um, and, uh, and Java, we, we of course need to continuously upgrade since it's continuously uh, reaching end of life, unfortunately. Um, so every release almost, we really have to keep up with the latest. Um, you do need to take into uh, um, Consideration that the service back installation could take a bit longer uh, than usual because of the indices upgrade step. Um, and it's approximately one gigabyte per minute. Um, and, uh, uh, the, and here you can see also the location of the previously indexed files. So if you have any specific questions on that, um, then uh, feel free to talk to Alex before you do the upgrade. So um, good, we have York here on the, uh, on the call. So this is a request coming through where basically um, there are customers uh, who don't yet want to upgrade to the latest, um, but on the other hand, they do want to have their SAML certificate. Um, um, uh, they want that to be the latest. So um, basically creating, um, uh, decoupling the SAML um, certificate from the Rosetta release. Um, so uh, here, um, this, uh, all, the, all, the, all that's required is to upgrade the uh, SPU till, and then that will include a ready 7.1, by the way, has a late, the latest uh, SAML uh, certificate, which uh, in theory 7.0, when it was released, uh, didn't have. Um, so uh, let's just see what this looks like. We have the, um, this 
version is 7.0. Okay, so when this came out, then the, the, the latest SAM certificate didn't come out. But if we take a look now, after um, restarting the SPUtil, so now we have under the authentication profiles, we add a new SAML authentication profile. Then down here, um, you have this is the latest. So this actually, uh, um, this was actually added um, again, agnostic to the actual Rosetta version. Um, data management. So we have um, fun stuff here, and um, um, the first one being uh, facilitating the whole error handling for batch zip. So I don't know if you have any technical analysts on the call, but this really should make life uh, um, easier. Um, the, the, this is really for various reasons. Uh, the first is. Um, again, following discussions we had specifically with, with Sam is also on the call here. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the, the initial, uh, motivation was to be able to create an analysis. If you have some, um, a technical issue with your content, with your SIPs, you would like to see, um, all the SIPs, which are affected by that error up to now, that wasn't possible. You could filter files, um, uh, by, uh, by a specific error. You couldn't filter SIPs by a specific error. Um, so beyond the analysis. That also allows you to then uh, run a batch um, action on all of those SIPs which have a specific error. So if you decide, well, um, all of the content which has a which has a incompatible format, for example, um, then you'd uh, you'd want to decline all of that. So now you can do that in batch for all of the SIPs which are currently in the workbench. Um, let's take a look at that quickly. It's, um, I think it's going to be quite useful for um, most customers. Let's get back. Okay, um, go back to management here. And in the technical analyst workbench. So first of all, we have a nice new select all records here. Okay, so if up to now you could mark this one over here, that would only mark a specific page. Okay, apart from those which aren't assigned to, to you. Um, now you can select all records. Okay, so select all records from all pages. Um, and also tells you how many were selected, because of course not all are selected, only those which are either unassigned or assigned to you. Um, you can also clear the section. So this is just for, for making life easier, but it also relates to this feature. Um, because um, for example, you can now, as you can see, the drop down here is not just assigned and unassigned, which was the kind they filter up to now. You can also now filter by error. So if we um and it's also um, has auto uh, complete. So if we look, for example, uh, format identification by file extension, filter that, then we get only those three. And now that you have uh, those SIPs which are affected by that uh, error, then you can now select all the records. This could be, of course, multiple pages, which in which case the um, select all would be very useful. And now um, you've got all these actions over here, reject, decline, assign to rerun and so on. Um, which you can, uh, uh, which will now be applied to all of the SIPs, not just this specific page or, um, or those which are, which were manually selected. Um, okay. So here allowed exclusion of source metadata from indexing. So this is really a, another case that came from customers, specifically Getty and, and others. Um, where uh, they have a huge source metadata, which uh, um, which has been indexed automatically, um, but uh, they don't need it. On the one hand, they don't need it really to be uh, indexed, um, at least not all of the source metadata. Um, and uh, um, uh, and so we're allowing now in the uh, uh, the different code tables, we're allowing to exclude um, different source metadata types from the indexing. So it's of course going to be stored. Um, and viewable and editable and so on, but it won't be indexed. Um, so, um, and so once you change the setting, you change the configuration, then from then on, um, any new content won't be indexed. But if you run full AI re-index, then also it'll impact all of the existing um, source metadata. Um, so that would be under the um, code table. Sorry, the mapping, other source metadata subtype, for example. We edit this one. 
then you can see here that we have the option of indexing, yes or no. So that's for the other. And um, metadata type. So here we have a mixture of um, the, the, the standard descriptive and uh, those which are source metadata. And those with such source metadata, um, they can be uh, changed from yes to no. And once it's changed to no, then um, the source metadata of uh, that specific type uh, won't be indexed. Okay, let's move on then. Um, here's just some miscellaneous nice stuff that also came through in this release. Um, we have a submission job for automated Bagit ingest, which also came through from the working groups. Let's see if we can just quickly show what this looks like. Um, because I really want to show, manage to show everything and to talk about the hosts in the end. So here, for example, we have, this is on the NFS, we have uh, the a test bag, a Bagit, um, and in the system, we may go in and take a look at the submission job. Then, first of all, let's see the material flow that we have. And if we're ready here looking at the material flow, then I'll also show you the completion of uh, the work that we've done around material flows. So, bag it, update. Uh, so here we have the uh, Bagit, and this is the one which we're going to be running with a submission format. Okay, so we have the submission format here, Bagit, the content structures, Bagit, um, and so on. Here, as you can see, you know, we started this uh, uh, this effort last release, and this is uh, really cool because, if, for example, uh, and now we completed it for all of the sections here, access rights, they all can now be um, <clears throat> edited. Uh, so, for example, if you're not sure what internal NFS Bagit is, um, just again, a reminder on this, uh, this nice feature, um, then here you can go into this page now. And in terms of NFS bag it, um, update it, for example, you can change the name and so on, and then you can just branch back to the, back to the material flow and it will now be, uh, include all the edits, which you just did. Um, so. Uh, and now when we go into the um, submission job, then uh, here we have a Bagot submission job, which I created for 7.1, which is uh, of course using, it's running on this uh, material flow, the Bagot material flow, which I created. Um, and we can run it now and uh, um, it should be quite quick because it's a, uh, Take a look at the history. And we'll see the results of the run now, which I just did. Success, um, SIPs, which opens in the report. And here we have Okay, this is the SIP, uh, which was just uh, imported with this SIP ID. Um, so, um, so now it's also automated for Bagot as requested by the working groups. Um, in addition, um, also requests coming through from the working groups and the system operations working group, a lot of stuff coming from, from uh, good stuff coming from that working group. Um, so verify files count match and CSV zip. So there are cases in which the CSV and zip um, there's a mismatch between the uh, number of files. So um, in this case, the zip, the CS, the zip file included more files than what are actually indicated in the CSV. There's a gap between the, the zip and the CSV. So it was always one direction. So always up to now, if you had a file which was indicated in the CSV and wasn't didn't exist in the zip, then we it failed to the TA, uh, TA workbench. Now it's working also the other way. So if there's a file which is indicated which exists in the zip but isn't actually indicated in the CSV. Then it will, it will also be, uh, it would also fail to the, um, to the workbench, including, um, information. On which files exist in the, uh, uh zip folder and not in the CSV. Um, in addition, where this is a completion of the publishing enhancements, 
So uh, you're going to see um, more information now in the logs of the publishing, which uh, also came through from the working group. So um, I think this was from the delivery and integrations working group. Um, so now we have in the IE publishing, we have a Rosetta configuration name and exist in addition to existing configuration ID. We have a count of IEs that has been added, removed and updated for each publishing uh, profile or run. And then for collection publishing, uh, we have details on collections which were published successfully, which we didn't have up to now in the logs. Um, and finally, this just, is just a really annoying bug, uh, which has finally been fixed. Um, the general parameters uh, can be null now. So up to now that you couldn't actually uh, uh, put a null value. So now you can do that in case you populated the wrong field and you and you regret it. So um, now you can just set it to null. Um, so those are the small things um, which bring you joy in life. Um, so user experience. Uh, so the personalized dashboard, um, let's skip to the, back to the management. Sorry, this again is the seven environment. Um, so the dashboard now is uh, configurable. So first of all, as you can see, we separated now. There's a slight UX change. I'm not sure if any of you would, would notice it, but the, we now have a, um, the box over here specifically for deposit submission and, pres and preservation, where the reports are slightly disconnected. And the reason is that now um, you can actually change those reports and they wouldn't be necessarily related to the actual area. So um, if, for example, the specific user is a preservation analyst, um, they would probably want to have more preservation reports um and uh, less uh, deposit which doesn't really interest them same for technical analysts for example um or you want to have a quick snapshot of the different processes um in the system um so here you can uh, just select one of these um take the publishing statistics or the um delivery statistics um and several other reports which you can uh, which you can see here in the uh, dashboard um and uh, so, so that, that's quite nice. It's completely personalized. So, um, of course, it's saved only for the specific user, not for the institution. Um, so you can see only what interests you in the dashboard. Um, so this uh, set over here of reports, uh, where we added some and we designed them to match to fit into the dashboard, uh, we're going to be adding more in the future. And of course, um, you can add your own. Um, here, I have a link over here to the uh, uh, to the um a blog about how you how you add a uh, custom report to rosetta um and also you'll have to design it with specific uh, number of columns and so on so that it will fit in uh to the dashboard um and in addition the report names now are customizable in the reports mapping table okay so i won't show that because it's pretty straightforward you can take a look afterwards um and this is in addition to a new report location where uh, dashboard which defines of course which ones will be displayed in the drop down of the dashboard so we're continuing our work on accessibility, um, investing in WCA G 2.1, um, continuing to fix back in pages um, and uh, working with a third party advisory group. Um, so this is huge work. So it's really um, ongoing and we're, we're very much hoping to complete this in the next um, uh, release or two. Um, and once it will be, we will have the VPAT um, template produced for, for Rosetta backend. Um, and just a reminder that all of the front end pages are ready um 2.1 compliance which is the latest so around integrations we have the rest api so um let's first just take a quick look at developers network um let's see let have it open so now we have under rosetta apis we now have two subsections of REST APIs and SOAP APIs. Okay, so we have the splash page here, which is all information, uh, which is general information. And then we have a page for REST APIs, um, including uh, the existing the reference to the SOAP services and uh, the list of current web services that we have for uh, REST, which we are continuously adding more, um, and then information which is specific for REST APIs. Um, and uh, we uh, for, uh, for let's take for example the delivery web services which was recently added uh, which was actually added now in seven 
Um, so here you have all the documentation and so on. And it's not only a matter of creating a parallel REST APIs. We've been working with, we had a focus group of uh, APIs. Uh, several of the, the uh, participants are here on the call. We've got some fantastic uh, feedback um, and, uh, um, and it has been uh, uh, also improved. Uh, first of all, the fact that it's going to be much simpler to pass and retrieve information from the JSON results. Um, but also you have a single endpoint for several services. So for example, in the SERP APIs, you had a specific API for CMS. Um, you don't need that here uh, because uh, the REST APIs are retrieving the information directly from the database, not from the METS files as in the SOAP. Um, so the CMS, the configuration of the CMS in uh, Rosetta in, then impacted also the information coming through in the REST API. Um, and same for, uh, we now have parameters on that endpoint. Um, let's see. Um, let's see this example. Oh, I have the session ID, which is expired. Um, so let's quickly. Do I remove the header here of WebEx, which is pretty annoying. Just one sec. There we go. Um, okay, so let's close this and search for. I just, uh, would like to see. I, I would like you to see this specific um, feature. So I'm just going to take a second to uh, set it up. So okay, so I need to view the object. Um, in order to have a session ID. And now. It will give you a session. And this should work. So this is the JSON that we have of the, the JSON result. Um, and you can see it has minimal data on the uh, actual files, just has what you need, um, which in many times is a sufficient file count and so on of the IDs. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to have uh, more properties, sorry, if you want to have more properties, then I will first type in the session ID. Then we have here expand properties. Okay, if we add that, you have two options, expands metadata and expand properties. Properties will give you uh, additional information. For files, you can see here the mime type size and so on, uh, which are now part of this. Uh, so again, on the same endpoint, we get all of that information. Um, and for a specific file, then um, we will take a look here and here to expand metadata. Therefore, we don't get the values for all of this uh, in case it doesn't interest you. Um, but if you want to change that, then uh, now you can get the properties for that uh, uh, file. Um, so also, we're going to be uh, um, uh, we're going to uh, uh, send out a blog uh, where we show an example of how we're delivering. We've got an EPUB viewer which uh, um, we've integrated into the system uh, using the REST APIs. Um, so we'll just send a blog to see how that's done, uh, just as an example. And any of you who are interested in using an EPUB viewer um, on the fine level, then of course that could be useful for you too. So coming up, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, so coming up, roadmap focus areas. Um, so we're going to continue our work on REST APIs and, of course, the, the, the biggest effort, uh, exciting uh, work that we're going to be doing in 7, 2 and 8 is around structural IEs. Um, we are really running forward here uh, with our new business analyst, Dan Shore, who's doing a great job around here. Um, we're going to, uh, we've already sent you several questions. Um, and uh, really what we're doing here is, apart from the fact that the community did really most of the work in designing uh, the needs here, use cases and so on, um, then throughout our design, also, we're going to be sharing information and asking you, you know, questions uh, and getting feedback um, on the fly to make this as agile as possible. So we don't really send through something which uh, you see and you understand for the first time only once it's delivered. Um, 
So, um, yeah, so, so again, just a reminder for those of you who are less familiar, stretch to rule IEs, which has a typo here, um, then uh, um, this is about preserving the relations between the entities, between the IEs, um, um, also as part of the alignment with premise three, but uh, mainly to adapt to um, the uh, uh, practical use cases of our customers. Um, and uh, uh, so this is based, the design is based on a, a list of use cases where each customer sent through uh, how they uh, envision their own usage of uh, structured IEs. Um, so what we're going to be doing and what we're already doing um, is uh, creating uh, two classifications of IEs. One is a structured IE and one is a content IE. The structure one, of course, uh, represents a node in the hierarchy, but in fact, it's a full METS and a full AIP, uh, which would have administrative and descriptive metadata. Um, and uh, um, uh, and then under those, uh, it could have, uh, it would point via the relationship uh, semantic unit, it would point to either additional uh, levels of structured IEs or to content IEs. Um, and then these would have also a sequence number, so you could uh, control the sequence of um, the child IEs and so on. Um, so we're really finding the balance between, on the one hand, having this fully preserved including events, provenance events related to any uh, uh, changes which are done and so on, um, but also facilitating trying to, to provide it the most streamlined um, uh, usage as possible, um, not to have sort of the heaviness of what the premise sometimes does um, imply. Um, so we're going to have a similar page to what we have uh, for collection management today, uh, just for structural IEs. Um, so, as we've been discussing, we, we have first of all a base camp project uh, where these discussions are ongoing. So, if there's anyone who isn't there and wants to be there, then please let me know. Send me through your email and I'll add you on to the project. Um, so, uh, the plan is that towards the end of the next release, 7.2, we're going to be opening up the demo institute, our hosted environment. Um, uh, we're going to open up an institution per um, uh, user or, or customer who, who's interested in testing the functionality. Um, and uh, and then they'll have free access to uh, to test uh, um, some uh, uh, sample data and give us some provide us some feedback. It's going to be a, a proper project. We'll have a separate Basecamp project for that feedback. Um, so those of you also who are interested in being part of that pilot, then please let us know. Um, we're going to be starting off with Mets ingest, and we're trying to see how we're going to work with with institutions who are less familiar, uh, less accustomed to working with Mets, and rather uh, uh, work with uh, CSV. So we'll see if we if that will be possible too. Um, in addition, seven two, we're going to be um, adding uh, indexing of access copies. So those of you who manage access copies in Rosetta, um, this should be quite a significant improvement, where you'll be able to, of course. Um, search for any attributes on the access copies, not just on the permanent. Um, and uh, the next stage um, in eight would be the, the stage after that is extra is the um, uh, a mechanism for extracting and indexing full text for texture and image files. So it's going to be since it's going to be plugin based, we are going to provide an out of the box tool, uh, but you'll be able to also replace that with other tools for any uh, um, um, proprietary formats and so on. Um, and that will be um, searchable both in the back end and uh, in the front end. So integrations, this is a timeline. I see we're really slim on time on the on the timing and I want to uh, talk about the hosted. Um, so this is just the uh, estimated timeline for completing the REST APIs. Documentation, we're going to be doing a lot of work. This is actually a result of the feedback that we received from you in the annual working group meeting. Uh, so uh, first of all, we're working now on a lot of updates. Many of the documentation, a lot of the documentation has been updated um, already now. Uh, we're going to be adding how to's, for example, pre-processing, which um, you can see here, for example, we added um, just a few days ago, Jens um, added an article about pre-processing of transforming simple CSV to Rosetta CSV um, with a link to the GitHub, where you'll be able to, of course, um, create your own flavor of it. Um, so we're hoping to add some more of these in the future. And in addition, this is a huge project which we just got a approval for resources for beginning of next year of 2022. We're going to be migrating the entire documentation from PDFs over to the Knowledge Center. Of course, those who prefer to have it in PDF will still have the ability of uh, migrating it over back to um, PDFs. Um, but of course, having these pages on, we're going to be benefiting from the infrastructure of the Knowledge Center, um, uh, where you'll be able to search across all documents. 
um, and you won't have to try and guess uh, where your um, guide is or the specific functionality which you're looking for and which documentation it is. Um, so I think that's going to be a really exciting um, uh, change, which should be ready for release eight. So community updates, uh, these are the working groups. Those of you who are not part today of working groups and want to have an impact on the product, please reach out to me um, and, uh, and we'll work together with the work group leads to, uh, um, to add you on. Uh, this is good not only for um, knowledge sharing, but also for having actual impact on the roadmap. As you can see, um, a lot of the functionality that came through is a result of the analysis of the research of the uh, working groups. Um, so uh, we, um, as you know, we participated, we sponsored the IIIF um, annual conference, um, which, uh, which of course relates to the. Uh, uh, we, we, we're actually one of the uh, of the um, uh, one of the only um, commercial vendors who upgrade who have got the latest um, IIIF version, uh, which supports non-image sequences. That was uh, uh, introduced in one of the previous versions. Um, we are sponsoring OPF. We have now also renewed our sponsorship of Digital Preservation Coalition. Uh, we are also working towards sponsorship of IPRESS 2021. Um, an up-to-date map of our uh, um, uh, customer, um, uh, a geographic spread out, including the, uh, um, a, um, the nice new additions of KB and the National Library of Estonia. And we have some also uh, um, um, some new uh, newbies who are expecting to receive soon. So Rosetta hosted how much? Okay, it's nine forty-one at least here in Israel. Um, so it's really I'll just give a brief overview of what uh, of what we're currently offering. Rosetta hosted. Um, Tamar started talking about it with the community in the annual working group meeting. You did request to have a follow-up, so I know this isn't a lot of time here, but this is at least to give you a bit more information. Um, so you can then reach out to me, or we can even set up an additional discussion just to understand what this is all about. Um, so we are going for a dual play strategy. So we're basically we are continuing investment um, in a single uh, solution. So this isn't about creating a completely different um, SaaS solution, for example. Um, this is the same Rosetta which you're familiar with. The same roadmap is going to uh, be applied for both flavors, um, both on-premise and hosted. Um, we're simply uh, doing a lift and shift of the solution, the on-premise solution, um, over to the Exlibris cloud. Um, and this is following a market or a product analysis um, where the, the, the understanding is that there are institutions who are interested in all the flexibility that uh, Rosetta has and the deep feature set that uh, Rosetta has, but does not have the sufficient IT resources on the one hand um, in order to maintain an on-premise solution. And we're seeing more and more um, um, mainly small and medium, medium institutions um, who are really driving towards a cloud first policy, um, uh, attempting to reduce IT resources. Um, so it's really a solution for that profile of customers. Um, and on the other hand, um, the, um, um, it's also for institutions who don't necessarily need to have the data on premise. So the data is going to be exported, uh, of course, out to uh, an external data center, which uh, for many institutions, especially around digital preservation, um, is not desired. Um, so we're going to be continuing um, um, without any plan to uh, uh, to stop any direction on any one of these. Uh, we're going to be going in both directions. Where at the end of the day, the advantage here is that a single development team um, is going to be providing functionality, which is going to be good for both. So the main resources that are required in our hand, at least for the hosted uh, uh, solution is uh, from the cloud um, uh, department here, uh, installation and so on. Um, and, uh, but we are going to be working on um, um, improving or enriching the out of box um, um, tool set, um, which is also, again, uh, both types, both on premise and hosted, they're going to benefit from that. Uh, so what exactly are we offering? So as I, met, so, um, as I said, we're we are hosting uh, Rosetta on Libris private cloud. And um, and it's important to understand about Exlibris Cloud is that it's true that the offering is new of Rosetta hosted, but on the other hand, neither Rosetta is new here. So this is a proven and uh, um, and uh, solution with a deep uh, feature set. And also the Exlibris Cloud is uh, um, is of course uh, uh, based on the state of the art um, Infinidat um, storage solution, 
uh, with the uh, with the high availability, security, and so on, um, uh, which uh, uh, the the platform today provides will also provide the same uh, level of security and availability for uh, Rosetta hosted. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a lifted shift. Uh, currently, the uh, the sol the solution right now is going to be limited to uh, smaller size institutions. This is uh, mainly for the first state where we are um, utilizing the the uh, Exlibris cloud for the application database and file storage. So as long as that is the flavor, then we're going to be limiting it for customers which have up to 200 terabytes of files. It's important to understand. Um, and um, let me just skip to this uh, slide. Um, so for an institution, a new institution that comes to Exlibris, but also for um, institu existing institutions who, uh, who again have um, who their, institu their, their institutions, their IT is really working towards a cloud first policy and would like to consider at least have a discussion about it. Um, uh, then so these are just some of the considerations, of course, for hosted, you are saving your IT resources. Um, you're benefiting from Exlibris cloud security and availability. Uh, we're going to be providing the server monitoring um, and for database and application and storage, um, as we do for all our hosted solutions. Uh, the on-premise, um, you're going to have continue having much more storage flexibility, um, where you can plug in um, the uh, basically any vendor which you like, have also public storage such as Amazon, Google Cloud, and so on. Um, you'll have full server access to also plug in server related tools um, such as Kibana and so on. Um, the data is not exported, so those who don't want it to, to have uh, to be out uh, out of the outside of the premises of the uh, institution, then of course the on premise is the, the ideal solution. Um, and the openness, it's always going to be much easier to uh, extend uh, Rosetta on premise where uh, from the plugins point of view and so on. So while that is going to be possible on the hosted, um, it's going to be uh, much more flexible as you have today um, for various reasons on the on-premise solution. Um, from the roadmap point of view, then the next stage, again, no um, exact timeline, it really depends on um, the, the, the market and so on and the needs, uh, then we are going to open up the hosted solution to be able to connect to local storage. So basically, we're going to be separating file level services, uh, which are going to be running on-premise on the file storage while the database application and so on is going to be hosted. And I think that is then going to be a, a big news for those who do have above 200 terabytes um, and have much larger repositories, um, but are interested in having um, uh, the uh, application um, hosted and not on-prem. So we have some time for questions. Um, I see there are some questions here in the chat, but you can actually unmute yourselves and uh, directly ask questions. Um, so a question from your question rebagget submission. Does Rosetta support the full Bagot one RFC or are the parts that are unsupported that we need to be aware of? Just double checking because many software suites only support version 0 0.97 from before the RFC release. Let me Copy that question, and I'll get back to you on that. Um, any questions on the hosted and on-prem? And as, as I said, those of you um, who this might be relevant for, then um, feel free to reach out just to have a further discussion. Okay, so um, I see there are no more questions. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I hope you do enjoy your holidays if you have some which are upcoming. Um, and I will send out the recording um, as soon as possible of the sessions. You can send it over to your colleagues. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, bye, everyone. See you in a week's time, Daniel. Yeah.